Hi, this is Dr. Scott Young, and today we're going to do a four-part series. It's in our What If I Don't Believe in Asara, but I wanted to break it up in four different areas. It doesn't benefit me. And we'll get into that and explain it pretty thoroughly. Coming right up. Now, I'm going to break this up into uh, four different parts, as I said, <clears throat> but why I want to talk about this, and each one we're going to give little tiny details that will help you through that, okay? So first off that I keep hearing, and it's very common because it's in the background, is this conversation of fairness. Now, if we're in a small group of people, Let's say you're having a study group or you have friends over for a book club or a Bible study or whatever that might be, right? Can we create fairness or basically a structure that the people in that group might want? Of course. Um, so, um, you know, I have, I have this family member who um, they, they have a Bible study kind of orientation and when they're in there, it's young adults and and they're always picking their own kind of ways. Now, would I do it their way? No, necessarily. Would I not do it their way? No, not necessarily. I'm just saying it's it's okay for that particular structure. And fr frankly, they get into the Bible quite a bit, but they actually have a lot of fun in the middle of that. So that was that's the reason for that structure. So in essence, you might say, well, that's fair or that's effective for that particular group. But when you start getting bigger and bigger, like for a, um, a town, to a city, to a, uh, to a state, and then into regions and into nations, because, and we're gonna stop at, at that because <clears throat> that is one of the problems with globalism, is they don't, they think that everyone has to follow a certain set of, a set of guidelines. Um, America isn't going to follow what South America is going to do. South America, or specifically Brazil, isn't really interested in what might be helpful for Honduras. You see what I'm saying? And when you start like extending those standards outside of particular borders, it becomes much more of a problem. But you see that same thing happens when you look at, when we're talking about this Nassara piece. And let's give an example. So <clears throat> we're just going to talk about um, Australia for just a second. In Australia, with the Nassara Jassara, so um, Australia is her own country and has her own set of problems, right? So she has water locked all the way around, but there are some really interesting land masses in the middle that have a lot of desert type areas, very desolate. There's not very many people that are out there. One of the more interesting movies called uh, Tomorrow When the War Began is an Australian perspective. It's actually a whole book series, real interesting, um, from these kids, sorry, uh, from these kids who, it's from a kid's perspective. And it's, the author really does a good job at explaining it. And it's the Chinese who come down and just get all jiggy on the Australians. And almost no, no one comes to their defense. And, and we talk about what is effective and even the conversation on the back end of this is <clears throat> after the war is overall won, and they mostly take care of the Chinese that are in there, um, they still have many of the Chinese in particular areas. And you go, well, that's not fair. And, and you know, both sides will answer this fairness question. And I go, listen, you haven't, when you talk to me about fairness, I, I first look at those kinds of things on a more nationalistic scale of how do you create fairness, right? We have to work from the constitution and say, listen, people need to have a freedom within a law or legal structure to come up with a way that they can make a difference in their lives, to have, it's what's called happiness, the pursuit of happiness with that. So one of the ways that people start with is that they put in this conversation of the UBI. Universal basic income is actually um, addressed pretty significantly by the Great Reset idiots. They want you to believe that if everyone had a universal basic income, 
And again, we are not talking about social security and disability, not talking about social security and disability when you talk about UBI, because UBI means universal, do you see my point here? Universal basic income with that too. And in universal basic income, what we look at is let's, and I'm making up a number, let's just say it's $4,000 a month. And many people go, oh my God, I'd sign up for that in just a second. But here's what happens when you create a universal basic income, you would have an expectation upon what you want them to do. Now, if you're talking again, we're not talking about social security and disability, right? If we're talking about people who, you know, who are getting $4,000 a month, are they contributed contributing into society? I mean, that's, that's really the whole point. And, and without getting, you know, Great Reset Nassara stuff and fair or not, if you're going to pay the, the people of, of your country a UBI, you should expect something from that. For instance, the military does it today, right? If you get into the military and you are going to, you want to be an airplane mechanic, you want to be, um, like my sister, she was a helicopter mechanic. Uh, so it kind of changed her, her focus. Let's say you were going to be an IT specialist or you were going to be a sniper or whatever that might be, right? And, and you were looking at those particular job points. What happens is that you have a universal basic income. <clears throat> Actually, it's a somewhat of a merit-based point based upon your, you know, your entry status and your growth within it. So the more value that you create, the higher that your pay is. But when you stop being more valuable, you don't get the extra pay. Do you, do you catch the point? But guess what? You don't have any control over where you would go. And maybe you might not even have control over what you might do. You might be, uh, I mean, I have a, a uh, sort of distant cousin, uh, nephew, and he's in the military and he wanted to fly, uh, fly um, jets. And he actually did after going to Air Force. And yet, because of other injuries and him just not playing along, and this is his statement, and him not playing along, well, that, that turned into he's not growing as much in the field. Now, th those are just realities of, this, of the role. But when you talk about UBI, you're saying to me that each person would create a value. That's what we do. If you have a valuable currency system, they have to create value. And I'm sorry, but that is just the fact of the matter. And if you give people $4,000, you create an entitlement of people. This is the exact problem that we're having. And this is what, where it started from is FDR creating this levels of entitlement. Now, there are some great points of what FDR was doing of, of Social Security, of, of disability kinds of things, <laughs> basically, and unemployment. As someone, you know, just lost their job, it's not their fault, but the points have to be, and again, I don't have problems with short-term kinds of things or people who cannot possibly work anymore because physically or age-wise they can't work. Again, that's not related to this, but UBI still has to say they have to do something in the society or they are just going to sit around. And that's the problem when you say that because you create that level of entitlement. Number two, when we explain to, when I have people, a truthers, who explain to people that we're gonna return all the taxes. When was the tax code created? 1913 and the 16th Amendment. And it was created to be a 20 year locked, <coughs> excuse me, time frame of 1% of Americans paying 1% of their amounts. This is what they've told. But as soon as the Great Depression, the fake way that they did this, um, and it's around 33, that they basically expand it to every single person. And they do it gently so that they didn't you know, push, it, push people. But it became more and more pervasive because what they wanted to do is expand their own personal money pool in their own pockets. Right. And so let's say you are, um, you were born in 1947. 
So that means that you're, you know, a um, little over 80. Uh, is that right? If I did that right. Well, just make it easier for me. Okay. You were born in 1944. And at that point, you are, um, you're 80 years old. So, and, you know, 2024, we're 80 years old. <coughs> the other person was 77. Sorry about that. And if you're, if you're 80 years old, born in 1944, just in the middle of World War II, World War II, which would put you in the greatest generation viewpoint just outside of the baby boomers, what you would say about that is that how many years of, of taxes would you be talking about? Well, if you started work just to ease sake and, and, uh, and uh, let's say from 1944 and you started in 62 at 18 years old, okay? And from 62 all the way until, you know, uh, let's just say 2010, you were working that whole time that is, you know, almost 60 years or 58 years of taxes that come in. And if we take 58 years of taxes at, at just a minimum number of $10,000 of taxes, which is not necessarily the case, but let's just say that number, you're talking about over a half a million dollars pushing on $600,000 of coming back to the person. Well, that's a massive amount of money. And I'm not saying that, that someone might or might not deserve it. it is not about deserving and it's not about fairness but it's going like okay great we did that for the 80 year old i can almost get behind that but it becomes a situation like when when do you stop it if you said if you're born in make up a number um 1970 anyone from 1970 and before gets a certain amount of it and then anyone 1970 and beyond um, gets a lesser um, or gets nothing, right? Well, what if you were born in January 2nd of 1970? You, you were only two days away from getting all of your, your income tax coming back to you. And you're going, well, that's not fair. You see, and, and you have to have a shut off in those kinds of things. And it gets really convoluted and very difficult to answer those questions. And that's why it is, it is not about fairness. It is not about like trying to make everything perfect. And we will get into that a lot more. <clears throat> then this is, and I'm not going to give his name, but this started in 2021. And when we started hearing about the interest is coming back to you, which means all compound interest. And we're talking more specifically, obviously cars and houses, but it could be other kinds of things. And, the, and there were, there were conversations, and this is literally the conversation that I was hearing in 2021. Well, if you bought a car too early, like, you know, only two years old, and they were, they were literally saying the, the exact date. If you bought a car after 2019, which is only two years old at that moment in time, you wouldn't get all of your interest back. Okay, why not? Um, did you not, like, you know, did you not qualify for that kind of thing? Oh, but if it was if it was older than that, then you might get your interest back or a house or anything else. And you just go like, when does this because here's what happens. All of these people are trying to answer this one thing. Is it fair? So they kept coming up with conversations, whether it's UBI, whether it's return of taxes or return of all your interests kind of things. And they were answering this fairness thing. You cannot answer fairness. You think you can, but as soon as you do what I would call in a weird way, the group politic, which means everyone in that particular group, when you start coming up with it, well, then she's not getting as much as he's getting. Oh, now we have, now we have, uh, you know, feminine masculine issues, right? Oh, great. Uh, and then we have, and then we go, because by the way, some, some men make more money than women do on an average basis. I mean, and so okay, now we're going there. Okay. Now let's bring up racism. Now let's bring up, well, I didn't have as much time in the workforce because I had a child or any number of issues. And it just becomes this nightmare point that occurs. And I know that's not thrilling for you. But that is one of the reasons why people get so pissed off at me for talking to you about a macroeconomic issue, a macro political point, 
because you have to kind of say, you know what, we're not going to make everything fair. I can't fix how someone screwed you over. Now, over behind me <clears throat> are some books. One of my books is, and this is a notebook here, is dedicated in the very beginning of this. I looked back over my history and looked at people who screwed me over. And there's a guy named Adams. He's dead. He's far, far dead. So I, you know, we won't know who he is. But he was the cooperating teacher from my university. And he screwed me out of my student teaching, which screwed me out of the ability to have my teaching certificate and to have that part of the degree. Because in essence, you, you have a dual degree when you're doing education, secondary education. You have English and education. That's how they, they looked at it when I was going to school. And so, I mean, I, I was it was stolen from me. Now, I was mad about it for a long time. And God goes, you know, you got to get over this. You can't go back in time and fix that. How about Jesus? Did he, did he heal every single person that was existed in the world at the time that he was alive? You see, when you start getting into the all and, and you know, the, in, in essence, the body politic, you never get answers here, right? Okay. So now we see the problem. Is there really an answer when we talk about what is beneficial to me? Okay, let's get into that a little bit. Number one, free elections. <clears throat> when we fix the electoral issues, now I'm not talking about electoral college, I'm talking about the electoral issues, whether it's voter fraud or election fraud issues that you can go and do some plenty of study on. What happens is that you allow the person to be able to vote. Now, both sides, specifically the Democrats, are telling you all the time, vote, get out there and vote. But they're still allowing um, illegals to go out and vote. Okay, that, that isn't what it's supposed to be about. And yet, <clears throat> from LBJ, and frankly earlier, but LBJ is one of the most powerful, influential people that have corrupted elections all the way through. There's There are long conversations when you get into the JFK uh, death and, J and LBJ, Linda B. Johnson, by the way, uh, took over for him, finished out his term, his basically almost a year and a half, and then, you know, won the next term and he won by a landslide in 1964 and stops. It's real interesting. He's the only one that actually stopped. He could have gone farther with that too. He didn't even get a, it wasn't even about an election. It's the only person that stopped. I don't know all the, all the details, but when you go back to 1947, he actually stole an election in 1947. There are people that he, that were killed around his situation and he got into different roles because of that. We see elections that are corrupted all the time. And this is the kind of stuff that we have to fix, because if we don't know who we're putting in government, then we don't have a real government. We have a fascism, a communism, a dictatorship, whatever you might say about it. Number two, when the IRS whoosh, goes away, every single person benefits. Are you sure about that? Yes, they benefit significantly. Now, of course, someone who makes $150,000 is going to benefit on a scale more than someone who makes $30,000. But if you're talking about a percentage, and I'm, I'm using a basic percentage of 28%, um, it's a lot less when you're down in the lower levels, but it, it still is a significant portion of your income. So if you're talking on a level, let's just move, make, <coughs> make up a number, at $30,000, or just make it an easier one, $36,000 a year. You make $3,000 a month. At $3,000 a month, and we're just going to use a standard of 20%, that is um, basically 600 bucks that comes out of your paycheck in that way, right? So 20% of that $600, what if you added $600 into that $3,000 a month paycheck? That changes everything. Do you see my point? Let's use that at a higher rate. If someone is an employee, not an owner of a business, but makes $100,000. And let's say that person, she's up here at $100,000. 
making that and she's paying 30% taxes. You're talking, you know, $30,000 a year. I mean, holy cow, that's like 2,800 bucks a month that, that doesn't come out of her paycheck. What can she do with that? What about families? What about business owners? What about a whole bunch of different things? I mean, there are times that as a business owner, I don't even pay myself much of a paycheck, less than some of my employees. And yet then the company gets a profit and then I have to like write a check out of there. Like it's because of the capital gain stuff. This is how sick it is, right? So I hope that gave you kind of, this is the beginning. I haven't, we're not even close to finished here, but we're trying to give you an understanding of how it might benefit, but there's no way to be perfect for you. That still might piss you off and you might get angry and you want to leave comments. You got to be respectful. If you're not respectful here and you can say, I, I disagree with you. I'm okay with that. Um, but I've already heard it a thousand times. And the answer is, I'm not trying to make, make you happy. I'm not trying to like win your money because I haven't asked for money from you. Do you notice there's no advertising other than whatever YouTube might do? I'm not asking for anything from you. So do I benefit from telling you some, telling you ugly truths? No. Hope it gave you an idea. Thanks so much.